Well, hello there, imagination connoisseurs, and welcome to another Road Trippin' with RMB podcast. I am your host, Mike Bodden, and you're listening to our podcast recorded on Tuesday, June 21st, 2022. We're glad you're here. Now, as you know, <laughs> Robert Meyer Burnett and I uh, work together on a website called The Post Geek Singularity. It's an online community. It's a discussion board. It is a place for fandom. It is a, a place where we welcome people who love genre entertainment. That means science fiction, fantasy, or the works. If you're a fan of movies, if you're a fan of genre fiction, that's the place for you. And we love it when uh, when folks come by and watch our streams or listen to our podcasts or contribute to the conversations, submit articles, reviews, whatever. This really is a space built for fans by fans of genre entertainment. And today is a perfect example of the kind of content we're talking about. Today's episode is focused really around the release of the new film Lightyear from Pixar. And all it is is Rob and I talking about questions we've received in the last, I don't know, three or four days about this film, about Pixar, about how it's been presented to the public, whether it was done well or not done right, or whether Buzz was done wrong. Well, there's a lot of good stuff here. The podcast goes for about 45 minutes, maybe a little bit more. I think you're going to enjoy it, but, you know, we can't get things started until I call RMB, and that means I cue the sound guy, and he makes this noise. Well, good morning, Mike. Good. Once again, I wheel my way west from the 10 to, uh, to the John Campius Studios. That is awesome, and hopefully the drive is, uh, is relatively uneventful as we have our little chat. So Yeah, the guy in the, the, guy in the far left lane here is driving very slowly. <laughs> Well, that's always the way. That is that is the way. Maybe he's Mandalorian. Who knows? When people are passing you on your right, you're going too slow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's L.A., Vato. Come on. <laughs> well, don't, you know, you're already the, the uh, gatekeeper of geek fandom. You can no longer be the gatekeeper of, of traffic control. So, in so yeah. Cal. Although, Mike, a lot of people are not seeing the humor in it. They don't understand. Yeah, I know. We have a lot of people that like aren't getting the joke. I think, which is kind of funny. <laughs> the, the irony, <laughs> the irony is uh, is uh, funny in and of itself. But enough of that. I mean, we've got tons of letters to go over. I'd love to be able to go ahead and read those. And Lay it on me, brother. So I know that I know they are good. So let's go ahead and get right into it. We've got a letter. Actually, this is one uh, from last from uh, last week this is from joey hamilton and uh, so let me go ahead and read that one here real quick it, because this is about light year and and the fall of pixar so this is a letter from uh, imagination connoisseur joey hamilton hi rob i have to rant about light year for a minute first i sort of reject the idea of this film even existing Firstly, the entire idea of Buzz Lightyear, the Space Ranger, was intended to be as easy to digest as possible for us to understand the toy. Therefore, Buzz was an amalgamation or parody of other sci-fi and fantasy heroes. In the glimpses we get into his world, such as the back of his toy box and a video game seen in Toy Story 2, it is basically a riff on Star Wars, 2001, A Space Odyssey, and the Flash Gordon serials. I protect the galaxy from the evil Emperor Zurg, sworn enemy of the Galactic Alliance. Buzz was a macho man, ultimate superhero, and every gadget known to man all packed into his suit. Now, if Pixar wanted to make Lightyear, uh, the Lightyear movie that mines a bit of Buzz's backstory but creates a new take on the character, I'd be okay with that. But no. Pixar wants me to believe that this was the film that made seven-year-old Andy a massive fan of Buzz Lightyear, and that simply does not make sense. Firstly, this is clearly not a 1990s film from its uh, its thesis to its social viewpoint. This is a 2022 film through and through. That is a minor problem, but it is distracting if I'm to believe that this film came out in the early to mid-90s. 
Tim Allen does not voice Buzz. Okay, I hear the point that the guy who played him in the movie doesn't always voice a toy, but in the glimpses into Buzz Lightyear we got in toy, at the Toy Story franchise, it was Tim Allen in the video game, commercials, and even the 2000 directed video Buzz Lightyear movie, which was a Saturday morning cartoon based on Buzz Lightyear of Star Command, a much more true-to-source material movie and later TV show. It just seems like that was the implication. Tom Hanks voices Woody on Woody's Roundup, so here's the big one, without spoiling the movie. They changed the relationship of Buzz and Zerg in a unique way that completely ruins the Buzz-Zerg toy relationship. Zerg was an evil emperor that Buzz had a clear history of battling. In this movie, well, you'll see. I just wish Pixar would think more about how making this kind of film played into the universe they're, set it, they're setting it in. It's frustrating. It just seems that Pixar is disregarding what came before and doesn't care how this affects how we view the Toy Story movies. I in no way buy that the toys we see of Buzz are based on this universe. It doesn't work on any level. That's from Joey Hamilton. So now, Rob, I don't, I don't imagine you've had an opportunity to see Lightyear yet. Um, only the have, first 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen the rest of it. They showed it to us at CinemaCon, but I've seen enough to know and I think Joey's analysis is spot on, uh, especially the point that the movie that they made was not a movie that would come out in 1995. Yeah. Made. yeah. And and I I don't you know I don't disagree with him. But however, that said, you know to me Toy Story is, and maybe this is my bias, but it's not something. It's not a franchise that I would would look at and and feel some canonical fealty to it because Mm -hmm. the idea is that it's a toy line. You know, it's like a Lego toy, a Lego toy line. Like when they do Lego Marvel stuff, they take liberties with the toys. Yeah. (laughs) They have to take, they have to make it palatable for a kid audience to give them play value and, and that kind of thing. So the idea that you're holding light year up to a certain standard is I I think it can still I mean his Joey's points are very salient and I I I don't disagree with them but on the other hand you could also say that it was a sophisticated science fiction film at the time and then they turned it into more of a kid-friendly franchise with animated shows I mean look what they did with the Star Wars Christmas special back in 78 (laughs) Exactly. I mean, or better yet, don't. But I mean, you know, it's <laughs> it's it's. I think it's a relevant point well, to make. I think that. I, in fact, I think it's ironic you bring up that Star Wars holiday special because you can look at that and and on one hand you want to just completely dismiss it as being non canonical and really ir- irrelevant to the inst- entire Star Wars story. However, that's where we met Boba Fett. So Right, I mean, well, we did in an animated segment, but I would do you one better. Mm-hmm. In that story, they're going back to Kashyyyk right. to, to, to meet Chewbacca's family, Itchy and Mala and his kid Lumpy, if you buy into that crap. <laughs> but, I mean, mm-hmm. the idea of Chewbacca returning home to his family for, which is what is essentially Thanksgiving, is not, a, or Christmas, is not bad. That's not a bad idea. Mm-hmm. I like that addition to Star Wars canon. It's just you didn't need B. Arthur and Harvey Corman <laughs> in horrible bits. <laughs> I agree. I agree. But I mean, they, they tried to make it this variety show for kids and a family friendly audience, and it exists, and they made it as much as George Lucas might want to disown it. Did add to the Star Wars canon, like you pointed out, they had the animated segment with Boba Fett, which is the first time that we saw him. Right. Right. So I think that fandom very often runs into this and doesn't doesn't handle this quandary very very well. Anytime this happens, is that the the process of making the stuff that we all love is a bit like making sausage, and sometimes uh, it's not very pretty. Even if we like the taste of the sausage, when we finally you know have the opportunity. To, uh, to consume it. And, and the fact is, you're, you're 
it doesn't really matter what the franchise is if you want to look at it from that perspective. But, you know, the storytelling process, the story development process takes place over over years and years and years and there are going to be inconsistencies and there are going to be things that that don't necessarily tie out now sometimes fans have fun kind of um obsessing over those sorts of details and many times there are very practical realistic and reasonable critiques and questions that can be asked about well why didn't you just take it this direction instead of that direction but the fact is you're always going to have in any kind of uh, any kind of story franchise. You're going to have the occasional, you know, Star Wars holiday special kind of thing happen. And I would maintain that it, I think it's patently unfair to try to create a, an entire Toy Story universe and try to tie this Lightyear film into it. I think that that's more mental gymnastics than people really need to go through. I'm. When I saw the film on Sunday with my family, I went because I really like that whole retro future vibe. I enjoy science fiction. I enjoy, you know, and I I really like Chris Evans. There's a lot that I was looking forward to. I enjoy Pixar movies. It was a good movie. It was highly entertaining. We walked out of there and people were, came out with a smile on their face. And, And I think that's what you want. But when you sit down and you start to really tear into it, as, as you and I discussed yesterday, you know, I think some of the confusion that fans are feeling and some of the disappointment that fans like Joey uh, might be feeling here um, are, you know, as much Pixar and Disney's fault as anyone else. They kind of did some of this to themselves. And, you know, I think it was a mis- I think it's a mistake to sit there and say, "Oh, this was the movie that came out in 1995 that got Andy interested in Buzz Lightyear." I don't, you know, as we as we talked about yesterday, I don't think that that's necessarily a very accurate depiction of what that first Toy Story movie was, because when you take a look at the toys, those weren't 90s toys. Well, you're right. I mean, as you pointed out, we were talking earlier about the fact that all the toys in Toy Story are vintage. Yeah, you know Woody's Roundup was not a shit. Uh, who's gonna have? First of all, who would have watched Woody's Roundup in the nineties? Yeah, and much less have a. I mean, they're all slinkies, Miss Potato Head, Edge of Sketch, all those stuff. Like you pointed out, those are toys John Lasseter had. And while Buzz Lightyear, like I remember, I had a really cool toy. It was like a programmable future tank that had a laser blaster, <laughs> and it was called the Big Track. Yeah. And the big track had a keyboard on the back of it, and you could map out your house and punch in coordinates, and you could, which I did. I mapped out our whole house so the big track could drive around the whole house, and it was you had to plot a course to go through rooms and doors, and I could get it to go down, to go around our entire first story, and it was fun <laughs> to do because you had to overcompensate for rugs and stuff, and it was mm-hmm. I love that toy, and it was very similar to Buzz Lightyear, but it, you know, and then there was of course. The Star Avenger, whatever it was, the same company. So there were there were these retro future toys, and like we talked about in the '60s, Major Matt Mason, which mm-hmm. is something as a little kid I would see remnants of it. I'd see Major Matt Mason toys at garage sales and oh, stuff, yeah. and I'd be like, "What is what is this?" Yeah, and I, they didn't sell, sell them. I was too old. I mean, I was too young. They didn't sell them anymore in the early '70s. You couldn't get Major Matt Mason toys. See, and I and I was just old enough. I'm just old. I'm like five years older than you, Rob. And I remember, dude, I had like three Christmases that were all focused on the Major Matt Mason. Uh, and he had like he had like a cohort. There was another astronaut. They all had plastic helmets. You had all kinds of devices that were. That where you would take him and set him in it, and he had like batteries in his backpack that would then power the lunar walkers, and that there were all kinds oh, of yeah, moon bases. There was all, all the, kinds of cool stuff, awesome. man. Yeah, they were awesome. Yeah, no, it was it was really fun. But I, you know, I think back too. It's like in the '90s when my kids were playing with GI Joes, they were those one twelfth si- scale size. You know, they're three and a half, four inches tall or whatever. When I was growing up, you know, my friends with GI Joes, those were those were 10 or 12 inch tall, you know, oh, yeah, guys no, with combat were, boots and stuff. Those were 12 yeah. inches. They were six yeah. scale. And they had incredible vehicles. Yeah. 
Yeah. And amazing, amazing. I mean, that's what I grew up. That that's what that's what fueled my initial love of action figures with us. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting because of Vietnam, GI Joes were no longer military focused. They were now they they morphed them into the adventure team. Yeah. So they were global adventurers. Yep. Which in a way was kind of cooler because they had more futuristic and sci-fi vehicles. Yep. But but like the little green army men in Toy Story. It, it, they're, they're, what, the little green army men are like in the first three Toy Story movies, I, I think. But we had 500 of those. And half of them were green, half of them were silver. And we would like, my brother and I would have huge battles between, the, between all the army men. But it's like you had plastic tanks and plastic jeeps and, you know all kinds of stuff but those are all like mid-century 50s or 60s 70s toys and that's what was in toy story so for me like when i was watching buzz light the lightyear movie on sunday i'm like dude so this aesthetic that of the lightyear film which by the way looks absolutely gorgeous just amazing um but it's definitely got that mid-60s retro future vibe which you know, I jam on anyway. I love that kind of stuff. But the fact is, is that I don't think this was a 95 story. So that's one point of confusion. Then the other big point of confusion that I've seen a lot of people talking about is, has did Disney kind of sabotage Pixar by putting all these, the last three releases on streaming and getting people, you know, used to the idea of seeing Pixar movies uh, on streaming. And that's why they're not showing up at the theater. And I think the thing that's interesting there is that I think that there's maybe some truth to that, but more importantly, Pixar kind of did this to themselves. What's the one, if you have kids that were born in the nineties, what's the one, what, what, what it's the group of videos that they watched over and over and over and over again on their TV. It was all the toy story stuff. Yeah. They, they got used to seeing toy story, not in the theater, but on television. And the challenge of putting Lightyear, of of all things, on IMAX as the first Pixar IMAX film, it's like for those of us that are interested in the aesthetic of IMAX and the visual impact and everything, we're gonna we're willing to shell out the money to go see it. But I don't think that's necessarily the audience for a Toy Story Pixar movie. I, you know, it cost me. Sixty-four dollars to take four people to go watch Lightyear, and that is basically, you know, what we'd spend a year for a streaming service. So, right, I'm not sure that Lightyear was really has been well targeted towards a family audience, if that was the desire. So, oh, I, I agree with you. You know, I, I mean, I think that especially because the last Pixar movie, the last three Pixar movies have dropped on Disney Plus. Mm-hmm. And I think that there was, I mean, look, it's it, it, it cost $200 million, it, it had a $50 million opening, which isn't great, but kids' movies have traditionally have, um, I mean, family movies have longer legs. Yeah, yeah. So this might earn out. Yeah, especially well. Especially one, I think it's a good movie. It is, it's, it's uh, entertaining, it's enjoyable. I wouldn't necessarily call it a kids' movie. I mean, there was... No. There's a there's a robotic cat in it, but other than that, there's no whole lot of. I mean, there's no kids. In no, it. there's a lot of adult concepts. In yeah, it. and I, yeah. you know, I, I appreciate it for that. But like you said, was this the proper? Was this the right thing to do with this particular franchise? Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I look. I I think good movies went out. I think this is from what I saw of it. You know, it's mm-hmm. a good movie. But well, there- yeah, I mean. I do think that our, our the writer of the letter, I, Joey, I think he was, he is correct in his assessment. I mean, if you're talking about, I mean, these movies were watched obsessively by people when it's, you know, anyone mm-hmm. who's younger than 35 grew up with these movies. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And, and you know, I think also the, 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 I agree that this wouldn't have been the movie that a seven year old would have seen. Right. So this would have been the equivalent of seven year old me going and watching Fantastic Planet and wanting a, uh, you know, a, a a model of, I don't know, what, Robbie the Robot, I'm maybe? Saying, Mike, uh, my nine, I was nine when my mom took me to Fantastic Planet. It was on the second 
Bill with Logan's Run, and she tore me out of the theater after the first 10 minutes. <laughs> Because she said, I refuse to sit here and watch an animated movie where people are treated like ants. <laughs> it took me years. It took me years. I think I was like 12 before it came to a revival house. And I saw it on a double bill with Ralph Bakshi's Wizards. <laughs> now that's, that's amazing. That's great yeah. in and of itself. So anyway, it's a great letter from Joey. Joey, thank you very much. I think you bring up some good points. One thing I would point out is that um, actually Tim Allen did not do the voice of Buzz Lightyear in the animated series. That was another voice actor. No, uh, Patrick Warburton did. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then there there have been plenty of times where other people have done the voices of of those characters and kind of voice doubled. The thing that I when I was talking to my kids about that and they were asking why didn't Tim Allen why wasn't Tim Allen Buzz Lightyear in the movie I'm like Tim Allen is the voice of the cartoon imitating the guy that's Buzz I mean so technically Tim Allen was imitating uh, Chris Evans right <laughs> which they just kind of cocked their head halfway and looked at me like well, like a confused or dog or the toy company didn't pony up the license fee to get the original actor's that's, voice to use in the toy that's right well we have another we have another uh, light year letter coming in this one from Brian Osborne who uh, he says, you know, Lightyear's struggling at the box office. Here's his letter. Hey, Rob and Mike, I've been wondering why Lightyear underperformed on its opening weekend at the box office when it would seem it had the makings of another massive hit. The answer that keeps entering my mind is that replacing Tim Allen with Chris Evans is the voice of Buzz. I saw the movie this weekend and liked it and thought the premise of it being Andy's favorite movie that he gets a toy, was, a toy for was great. But I can't help but think that if Tim Allen was still voicing the character, it would have helped bridge the gap and give the audience of the original films a sense of comfort that would have made them excited to see one of their childhood characters again and even bring their children to see it. Instead, it looks like a large portion decided to not even give the movie a chance. Even though I was always going to see the movie, I still went in thinking it was going to be different in the sense that it was separate or secondary to the story, Toy Story universe when Evans was announced as the voice. I think if they had Alan, they could have gotten more butts in the seats for the nostalgia and then surprised everyone with the good story they did tell. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, I, you know, I don't think anybody really cares who does animated voices, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, with this Toy Story franchise, maybe it's different. I mean, they have four other movies where Tim Allen played Buzz Lightyear. But I think that's all part of the premise. Right. You know, Tim Allen is playing a goofy version of this Buzz. Toy Buzz is not this Buzz. The Toy Buzz has a different personality because he's a toy. Right. Right. Well, I mean, I, you know, it's, look. I think the whole thing is that they're, they were weighing into some meta waters here, and some people liked it and some people didn't. I just think it's odd. Maybe they went to Tim Allen and didn't want to do it. He wanted too much money. Who knows? But remember, the Buzz Lightyear in this movie is young. Yeah. And Tim Allen doesn't have a young voice anymore. No. I mean, Tim Allen is, is, is at least, you know, 20, what was it? 27 year well okay Toy Story came out in 95 yeah yeah I mean that's that's you're looking, 30 years you're looking ago at 27 yeah 30 years older I mean maybe he can't do that voice anymore you know maybe he can't be the young man of the movie who knows well I would say this too is that if you were to cast this as a live action film would you cast Tim Allen or would you cast Chris Evans if those were, were your choices <laughs> well that, that I think is that's the greatest that's the greatest um, answer. You know, I, I, I think, again, as I had mentioned uh, earlier, I think Pixar did some of this to themselves in that visually there are parts of Lightyear the movie that look where the characters, and especially Buzz in his, in his space uh, ranger outfit, looks so close to the toy Buzz that I think it, it creates some cognitive confusion in the mind of the of the viewer that it's difficult yeah. to create a separation between between live action in cartoon form buzz and and toy action in cartoon buzz i mean they look almost too much alike 
So maybe if there were a greater visual distinction between the two, you would say, oh, it makes perfectly sense that they're not exactly the same. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand where Brian's going. And I think that you hear this concern raised, especially by, um, by fans who were closer to the age of Andy when Toy Story originally came out, too. I mean, I went to Toy Story 1 with my kids and had a major uh, uh, attack of nostalgia. You know, every time I go to a Toy Story movie, I walk out of there bawling, going like, oh, my God, I remember all that stuff from when I was a kid. My kids saw it as, like, an amazing adventure story about toys, and it's cool these toys came to life or whatever. And that's part of the wonderful glow you get out of the Toy Story franchise as a parent, when you can take your kids to it, and they fall in love with the toys. It's like doing it all over again. It's really great. Yeah. But, you know, unfortunately... Then they go, <laughs> now those guys, you know, my son went, loved Toy Story. My oldest son loved Toy Story. He was old enough to absolutely fall for it. He's 31 now. And, he, and you know, uh, yeah, I, he had a completely different reaction to Lightyear than I did. We both loved it, but he loved it for yeah. completely different reasons, which I think's good. You know, it makes people, it gives people something to talk about. I think it's, that's half the fun. So, well, that's why Pixar movies work. Oh, absolutely. They're, they're well-made, well-crafted stories. And, um, and I was glad. You know, for me, it was worth the money. It was a great Father's Day gift to myself, you know, because I paid for the tickets. But, you know, whatever. But, no, we had a, we had a, <laughs> we had a great time. And, and Pixar movies are always good for stimulating conversation around the Bodden dinner table, at least. I'll tell you that much. So, but thank you very much, Brian. That's that's a good letter. I think you had some uh, some interesting insights even in there, even though I don't necessarily agree wholeheartedly. I think you do bring up some really good points. So it's really great that you did that. Thank you very much. Our next letter comes from um, Danny Allen. It is also the, we're having a light year fest here on the letters, Rob. I got to tell you, this this letters light year. Let's ignore the lore. <laughs> it's Danny's headline. So Danny says, hey guys, big fan of the show. With Pixar's Lightyear receiving underwhelming box office, I feel many people are ignoring the core issue at hand. Pixar is literally ignoring a massive amount of Buzz Lightyear fans. They chose to ignore the, the lore from the Buzz Lightyear of Star Command series. They gave us subpar characters in Lightyear while ignoring classic characters like Booster, XR, Captain Nebula, Mira Nova, and Warp Dark Matter. I don't know if you know this, but back in 2000s, Pixar had a beef with the Walt Disney Television anima Animation Studios. They produced the direct-to-DVD 2D animation movies. I feel like Pixar is still bitter about what happened and took it out on Buzz. What are your thoughts? This is a fascinating question. I'll, I'll let you go first. Rob, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I mean, I, you know, that, that series has is, is like been buried. You can find mm -hmm. it online, but it's... it's and I, I don't necessarily think that, I don't think they have a beef, but I think that the way that Disney, look, with a company like Pixar, here's what you're, you run the risk when you're dealing with Disney. And when, when Pixar, you know, when Disney bought Pixar, they lost their autonomy. And you know that Disney's going to do direct-to-video movies. Mm -hmm. And the problem is <clears throat> Pixar is very meticulous about their storytelling. Yeah. And I don't think they would have done what the animated series did. And and so they, you know, they probably wanted to ignore that series. And that's why you can't get it anymore anyway. So, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because there's so much of this talk over lore on the Toy Story movies. <laughs> I'm like, I feel people's pain. Imagine my pain about Star Trek. Um... <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it, it just goes to show you that all of these things, I always say that pop culture runs like a, gen, it's a generational cycle. It's a 20-year right. half-life. And Toy Story, obviously, to, to people that are, like, in their 30s that grew up with Toy Story, because, I mean, if you're 27 years old, you were born in the year Toy Story came out. Right. So anybody from... I would say 30 to 45, these Toy Story movies are, you grew up with them. Yeah. And so it's a big deal. 
and you you know I, I, I now have a great a great um, example to point to when people ask me about Star Trek and why it bothers me so much because I grew up with Star Trek right and and most people that watch Star Trek now were born into a world where Star Trek already existed right and um, um, that's I mean I, I think with with lore like I have no qualms about Toy Story lore I, I, I don't ever think of Toy Story canon because it's a bunch of toys. Every time they get up in the morning, it's a different world they come up, they live in. Right. You know? Well, and if you're Rex, you don't remember the day before anyway. No. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the thing. And, and it's it, it's interesting to see people up in arms over the canonical fealty of Lightyear to the Toy Story <clears throat> movies. Well, it's, it's also funny to realize how many people kind of ignore the fact of what a big deal it was that Pixar went back to the well, the Toy Story well, and made a sequel. Uh, do you remember that when they finally announced they're coming out with Toy Story 2? That was oh, yeah. that was big news because nobody thought they would ever make any sequels to anything. But to come back and of all the franchises, of all the films to make a sequel of, to make a sequel to Toy Story 2, and then to have the nerve to put it in theaters and to, and to create a female Woody-type character in Jesse, it's like people were ready to completely blow this thing up in the first place, and they knocked it out of the park. They had amazing music. They had an amazing, heartfelt storyline. They had Stinky Pete. You cannot... I'm sorry, but you just... The, Stinky Pete's my favorite Toy Story <laughs> character because I have a brother named Pete, and he is also stinky. But, but the... <laughs> But the thing with Toy Story that people that, that's interesting is that um, kids who are like my kid's age in their mid to late 20s and early 30s look at Toy Story as if it's a foregone conclusion that there was going to be a Toy Story 2 and a Toy Story 3 and my God, a Toy Story 4 and then all these cards. They, that to them is a natural thing. And yet they don't seem to, you know, they weren't, quite old enough to realize what a big deal it was when Toy Story 2 came out and it's the same way now with modern Star Trek fans of course there was a regular there's an original series and of course there was the animated series and yeah of course I mean it took a few years but they finally got the motion picture off the ground and Rob I'm sure because you and I've talked about this you and I were typical Star Trek fans we could not believe there was going to be Star Trek in the movie theater it's like Oh my God, are you kidding me? This is like the most amazing thing ever. Who ever thought that we would ever get any more Star Trek? You know, there was a 12 years in the wilderness there before we saw anything. So Yeah, I know. It, it was, it was, yeah, well, that's the thing that nobody, what I find really interesting about, I think about fandom in general now, is that up until Star Wars proved the viability of big budget science fiction epics in the mm -hmm. theater. There wasn't such a thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had a few, a smattering of classic sci-fi movies over the, over the 30 years previous to Star Wars. I mean, you had George Powell movies like War of the Worlds and When Worlds Collide. You had Day the Earth Stood Still. You had Forbidden Planet. In the 60s, you had Planet of the Apes in right. 2001. Right. That's it. You know, there was no pulp, sci-fi, fantasy, big budget. They tried. I mean, there was a lot of dystopian sci-fi in the 70s. The year before Star Wars came out, Logan's Run came out, and that did pretty good. Yeah, yeah. But, but even so, the, even like the Planet of the Apes series, there was, there was a series of films, but they got progressively darker and, quite honestly, progressively worse to the point where the last one was like a joke. But, well, the last was a kid's movie, but the, yeah. the second to the last one has a lot in it that's really likable, and, and it is really dark, mm -hmm. and there's an R-rated version of it. And and I, um, well, so, so Star Wars is sort of this demarcation point for modern fandom. To me, it's ground zero of modern fandom. Mm -hmm. um, and everything comes, and now I've lived through it all. Like, I right. was a kid, you know, when Star Wars came out, and that that door that opened, I experienced all of it mm -hmm. while it was happening. Yes. 
segment, and it was um, because of that, and it, it's it's a it's a hard thing to convey to people that that and having gone into the being both a, a professional critic and a filmmaker and a pundit and all that 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 my knowledge and fandom encompasses everything that is now considered to be modern what modern fandom mm-hmm. is like all of it so I, you know if you want I could opine on all of this stuff but what is frustrating is that when I was a kid I understood the past of these franchises and I wanted to know everything about them I wanted right. to see all those classic sci-fi movies you know I would go watch everything and I feel that that's something that's missing from modern fandom you know, and if I have one criticism of, of, of fans is I feel that their perspective of where we're at is limited because there's not enough history in their backgrounds. Right. Well, know, there's a lot of talk. I mean, I was joking about being a gatekeeper and all this, but my problem is, you know, there's, there's the, a lot of the critical acumen is missing from modern fandom because there's no interest or desire. And, you know, I'm not saying you have to. Mm-hmm. But it, it's a, it, it is interesting to watch what has happened with genre fiction over the last, say, 70 years. No, I would agree with that. And, you know, I think part of it, Rob, relates to the amount of new material that's coming out. And yeah. it's just kind of washing over fans. Because if, if And I'm sure that you will completely chime in with this and, and know where I'm coming from here. But... As a Star Trek fan in the early 70s and only being able to watch the original series on reruns and suffering through the animated series on Saturday mornings for a variety of reasons, but... Although there were some good episodes of the animated series. There were, but it was... I mean, you know, it's... uh, There's some good stuff wrapped in a heavy layer of cheese there, but all that... limited animation did not serve it well. (laughs) No. It was made on the cheap, so... But... (laughs) All that, they had a lot of the original writers from the original series right. come back to write scripts. But here's my point. Those of us who were Star Trek fans and wishing and dreaming of a day maybe where we will be able to write and make our own Star Trek shows or something, we had something else that, that provided uh, comfort for us during that during the our days in the wilderness. And I'm thinking predominantly of two books. One was The Making of Star Trek, and the other was The Making of the Trouble, of Trouble with Tribbles. And they were both yep. n- big, thick, novel-sized books that provided a whole nother level of lore behind the Star Trek fandom that you see to this day when you go to a Star Trek convention. And that is, we learned all about the people behind the camera and the people in the offices and the and the... And who Gene Kuhn was, and who DC Fontana was, and my favorite Star Trek character of all time, Bob Justman. You know, we learned about the making of and developed an interest in and a, and a passion and a level of understanding that, quite honestly, for me, I'm much more interested in all the behind the scenes stories and, and the trials and, and tribulations, if you will, of making of making those episodes and and dealing with the studios and all that that kind of stuff absolutely fascinated with me it's fascinated with me uh, me but to tie that back into Danny's letter here he's bringing up he's talking about you know ignoring the lore and, and like ignoring the fact that Buzz had all these other sidekicks and friends and and colleagues in the animated series there's another level of lore to the whole Buzz Lightyear and, more importantly, Pixar relationship to Disney. And that is that when Pixar started, it was a joint venture between Apple, Steve Jobs. Actually, it wasn't even Apple. It was Steve Jobs, when he was in his exile from Apple, working and attracting uh, Disney into, into working on this animation stuff. The background of Pixar is decidedly non-Disney. And so right. the rub that he's talking about, this time period in the late 90s and the, and the early 2000s, of bef- right before Disney acquired Pixar and everything, is an interesting period of history in Pixar's development and in the development of Disney animation. I would su- strongly suggest that any true Pixar fan, anyone who's really interested in the, in the franchise that is Toy Story and all these other Pixar 
uh, films. And in fact, there's a great theory that they're all in the same universe, but that's, that's a conversation for another show. But I would strongly suggest that you look into the history of Pixar and understand that interesting, uh, odd relationship of the, uh, between Disney, Disney animation and Pixar and how, uh, and, and the players that kind of put that deal together and held it together and then were sent into exile. <laughs> because it's a fascinating right. story. So, yeah. And, no, no, absolutely. Um, well, Mike, listen, I'm at my destination. Oh, and you know, while we're talking, we received three more letters, Rob. Wow. I, the letters are coming well, in will, fast and furious, so we'll have to do more tomorrow. Yes, we will, we will absolutely do that. So, that is that is absolutely great and uh, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for calling in and Thank you to all of the uh, fans who are sending in so much great, uh, so many great questions to the Road Trip and Podcast. I'll go ahead and edit this thing up and, and get it up uh, this afternoon so that people can go ahead and listen to it on uh, their favorite podcasting platform and on YouTube, and uh, it'll be fun. So thank you so much. Anything else, Rob? You got it? Are we going to maybe get a Rob Servations this week, you think? Yeah, so I'm going to go back. I think today, yes, I'm going to go back to regular observations today i think today, yeah today hopefully yeah well people will be excited i will start sending you letters then so that you've got more stuff to talk about but thank you yeah, so much letters. I absolutely i sure will thanks so much for your time rob and we'll talk again later sounds good all right buddy take care okay see you yep see you bye well, that brings us to the end of another Road Trippin' with r and podcast. This one recorded on Tuesday, June 21st, 2022. Road Trippin' is a production of Imagination Connoisseurs Unlimited LLC and is transmitted throughout the post-geek singularity from our studios in the back room of Pizza Planet. <laughs> you can find Road Trippin' on your favorite podcasting platform and on our website, postgeeksingularity.com. We also post links to our podcast on all of our social media accounts. You'll find the PGS on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Reddit, Tumblr, and Discord. You know, I had someone ask us, how do I get onto Discord? And I always say the same thing in these podcasts, but let me explain. There's an even easier way, especially if you're listening on YouTube. Look in the description area uh, it, it, for the YouTube post and at the bottom of the description where I write some stuff about the episode and all that kind of thing, there are links right there for you to be able to join the YouTube community, which we would appreciate if you would do that. Or you can join the Discord community or guess, get this, you can actually join both. And, uh, and that's really great. The YouTube community is a... Um, a deal where you can support the the post geek singularity with a small uh, monetary contribution anywhere from 99 cents a month up to 25 dollars a month and like i said we appreciate it because um you know this is pretty much a a fun thing that we do but it gosh it takes a lot of time <laughs> other than that uh everything that we try to provide here we provide at no charge and we hope you find it entertaining and worthwhile. In addition to commenting and getting to know other imagination connoisseurs online in our various communities, whether it's Discord, Facebook, or YouTube, you are also encouraged to sign up and receive an email newsletter. Now, we send those out oh, a few times a week. I try to do it daily, but um, I have not been as successful lately as I'd like to be. So have patience. We'll get there eventually. The nice thing about the newsletters is that if you ever feel like you're getting too many, it's easy to opt out of a few and reduce the amount of email you get from us. But it's a good way for us to keep in touch, and we want to do that because we like communicating with imagination connoisseurs just like you. And in fact, to do that, we encourage you to send us a letter. You can do that by going to our homepage. There's a big button that says send a show a letter. You click on that. You go to a little web form. You pull down the menu down to Road Trippin' with RMB. You fill out the form. You hit send. And before you can pull a little green man out of a, toy, out of a claw machine, I'll have that email and Rob and I will be talking about it on an upcoming podcast. So, you know. Salute the claw, send us a message, join Star Command, I don't know, what else? 
enjoy the post geek singularity because we sure enjoy having you here this is your host mike bodden you're listening to the road trip and podcast and i'll talk to you tomorrow bye